Okay. Um, just to respond to one question, um, if, especially if you have a PC, if you uh, turn the PD on and you don't get that nice clear sign tone but get a beeping on and off sound like a truck backing up, that is because PCs have horrible uh, audio latencies and you will need to have this uh, delay number up to some nice high number like that. Or maybe even one time within, uh, within um, what was it? Vista machine, I had to do this on a laptop to get the thing to operate correctly. So, uh, so lesson one, don't use Vista, and lesson two is if you don't get a solid audio output, then that's a good place to change something. And, and, and increasing that will make the audio more robust, but will make everything react more slowly, so you know, it won't be as pleasant to use. Um, another thing that you can do if your audio insists on hating itself is um, he, whoops on button. Uh, you can ask it not to use audio input. Uh, you can do it that way, or you can do it by saying, "Hi, I have zero channels of input," and that will run PD normally, except that whatever audio input uh, device you have won't be getting. You haven't used audio input anyway yet, so it doesn't matter. But when you do, you will um, you'll make you'll make your computer's life slightly easier by not using that. But on the other hand, it would be nice to be able to use audio input because it'll show up later in this class. So, uh, so that would be a temporary measure to try to improve things if you're having trouble. Okay. So, yeah. So put some horrible number like one or three hundred up there. This is PCs. Macintoshes don't seem to have this disease, although Macintoshes do want this number to be at least. Most of the time. All right. Uh, questions about the homework. I, uh, three of you came up before class and had specific kinds of things to ask about the homework assignment. So it seems like it's a good moment to see if you have other questions that I can just answer for the group. But there are office hours after class too. So if you don't want to ask in front of everyone else, just come up and see me after the show. Yeah. So you know how we have to multiply like a lower frequency from like let's say 220 it's a side example. Right. Uh, why is that so? Because when it multiplies uh, like uh, then an oscillator just like take the half and just multiply it. let's say 220 hertz to whatever low frequency hertz it is the yeah. oscillator. So I just have to wonder why it's you have to multiply this two. Okay, so yeah, so why do you have to multiply two oscillators? So uh, this gets back to the example from last time, which rather than dig up, I'll just do it again because that'll slow me down a little bit and make me explain it. Um, so what we'll do is we'll, sorry, uh, make an oscillator. Uh, what I'll do is I'll make a nice 440 hertz oscillator, which we'll be able to hear. And to start with, I'll fix it so that you Just hear it without any without any control at all, really. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there we go. That's a bit much. All right. So, so this is this is the way to play an oscillator without losing your speakers, right? Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is try to respond to you by then controlling the amplitude, which is this multiply this thing as a signal. That means with a tilde object by some other oscillator. And let's let's make the amplitude, oh, let's, um, all right, I'll just type the numbers in to start with. So here's changing amplitude. Right. And here is changing the amplitude real fast. I think this is what you're asking. doesn't change the amplitude, it changes the frequency. Now this is this is psychoacoustics, which means it's not science, really. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm multiplying, I'm changing the amplitude of the thing 330 times per second. You can think of that as a time varying amplitude, but it's too fast for you to perceive. But now um, you can use a different fact, which is that the product of two sinusoids is the sum of two other sinusoids at different frequencies. So. 
in, in a confusing way of describing the situation, you can multiply something by a signal to change either its amplitude or its frequency depending on how you do it. If you, if you multiply by something that's varying slowly in time, let's see, let's shut this thing up. If you multiply by something that's varying slowly in time, that doesn't have a physical definition, by the way, but whatever that means, uh, then you will hear the thing changing in amplitude. If it's changing quickly in time, especially if it's changing repeatedly and quickly in time, then you will hear something else, which is new frequencies being introduced, um, which is one, one of the possible things that electronic musicians call modulation, although it's not the only one. Right. Does that answer the question at all? Or? Um, yeah, because my original conception of the, the oscillator object that the number after it, um, because you know when you first did it, it just kind of like changed the frequency. Right. I was, I was, I was going to have a hard time understanding what um, <coughs> in my head the difference between changing the frequency and the amplitude of it. Right. Okay. So maybe what I should do also while I'm at this is get set up to graph this thing again. So, sorry, this is repetition, but I don't think it's bad repetition. Um, I'm going to use the put thing and put down an array, and it's going to have a name like. Uh, uh, let's see what I'm going to call it. Um, see me. Okay, and I'm going to have a second. Ooh, how long am I going to make this? I'm going to make it a thousand samples to start with. Um, and I'm going to, I like points, and I'm going to say, okay. Oh, and, and I'm going to fix it so that it goes from minus 2 to 2 because I although I fixed the bug last night and you, if you download you will have the bug fixed version now in the test version of PD. I haven't fixed it here yet so so we're going to be um, we're going to be cautious I made the table now be from going to graph it which means I need a button sorry I know you've seen this all before and I need a tab right to know the name of the table it's going to write into. And it needs two things. It needs a message to tell it to write, and it needs an, oh, let's go here. And it needs a signal. And nothing happens. Why? Because it turned off. There. Oh, look at that. Isn't that cool? That's not a, that's not a sinusoid times another sinusoid. Any way you look at it, it's a sinusoid plus a sinusoid. But that's because I chose this thing. Here's, here's something where you can sort of see it, I think. Yeah. Up and now, you hear those gaps in the sound? That's because I have a very slow processor and I have to add to my delay. Okay, there we are. We're happy now. Okay, so now what we see is, uh, if you can imagine there's a sinusoid being multiplied by this other sinusoid. This one is going at 440 cycles a second, and this one is going 10 cycles a second, and the half cycle is about this long, if I can use the mouse to point to it. And what you hear right now is in kind of the nether region between beating and hearing two pitches. I hear two pitches, but I also hear beating at the same time, which is, I don't know what, that's getting on the wrong side of the uncertainty. If you want to only hear the two tones, make this number at least 30. And then, it looks like a sinusoid with changing amplitude, but your ear resolves the two sinusoids and sum that thing is into two different pitches that are about a musical second apart. Yeah. That's what this is doing. Yeah, I know, but it's just, it's just something that really, you know, like... Okay, so do this. Just keep going smaller. Yeah, make it a hundredth. Oh, yeah, so uh, it's acoustics again. Um, point 0.1 is minus 20 dB. Point 0.01 is minus 40 dB. Okay, right. And now the thing about that is, if you're having to pull it down that far, What's going to happen when somebody sends something of magnitude 100 into here? 
you're still going to get one and you're still going to get the nice loud sound that you don't like. So you also, if you want to, could protect your ears by uh, adding a clip object here, maybe from minus 10 to 10. Oops. I'll show you how to do this in more uh, sophisticated ways later, but now what we've got is actually this is this is one now I can turn the uh, now I can turn the the, the, the volume on the room. Oh, I don't care thing because I turned it off anyway. Okay. So now no, now if I put out something with unit amplitude, what will come out is minus forty dB. And furthermore, even if I make a horrible mistake and, and the and the numbers here are in the thousands which does sometimes happen, especially when I teach you how to divide, this is going to happen, then uh, clip it to some reasonable range. And in this case, if we clip it to between minus 10 and 10, and then if we divide by 100, then we know that no matter how crazy the thing is that we put in, it's not going to be outside of the range, plus or minus a tenth, which might be a safe headphone range for the computer. What I do, rather than do that, Typically what I do is I make sure that the volume on my amplifier is down so that no matter how stupid I am making the patch, it can't make more than a certain full blast volume. So my way of so my way of protecting my ears, which is you know important for musicians especially, make the loudest noise that you care to make. For instance, get out your test tone. No, I just haven't had it in the equipment. Yeah, okay, so get out the test tone. Do this. Oh, maybe don't do this anymore. And get this thing to be as loud as it's ever going to be. And verify that that isn't unduly painful. So I didn't leave it up there for long, but that was the loud. That right now, what you just heard, is the loudest thing that's going to come out of these speakers, period, with the audio system the way it's set up right now. That way, when I do something stupid, like take my white noise generator and stick it right into the back, um, it, won't, it won't make me jump out of my chair. Okay. This, I, I probably emphasize this more than it's really necessary to emphasize, but computer musicians surprise themselves a lot by turn, turning things up because they don't hear them, turning them up because they don't hear them, and then turning them on, and discovering that they, meanwhile, push them quite a few too many TV. Maybe some of you have had that experience already. Okay, so this is that sort of survival technique. Um, let's see what else do. I, yeah, that's about all I should say about that. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Okay, did you, uh, if you have the, do you have the 42 working version or the 43 test version? Okay, good, so that's problem number one isn't happening. Uh, you have to have, D, you have to have DSP on. In other words, uh, check the PD window and see that this thing, oh, which is, it's off for me right now, but that has to be on. Okay, yeah, it's good enough, yeah. All right, and then what else could be wrong? If you're actually clicking this, oh, someone said make sure the patch is not in edit mode. And then, <clears throat> next thing is obviously, maybe, obviously if I did something like uh, misspelled this, then I, it wouldn't happen, but then I would get an error message on the PD window. Dang. Oh yeah, thank you. Oh, that was interesting. Yeah, there we go. So look on the PD window and see if there are any helpful error messages. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Show me after class. It's, it's got to be something. It's probably something that I'll have to tell you all about Thursday because it's probably something important that I've forgotten to say. But I don't know what it is yet. Okay. Other questions? It's all good. Yeah? Is this No. It's 
far as I know, why you not give us a What's happening? Yeah, WebCT should just have a pointer to the... Yeah. And that's the thing, I haven't actually learned WebCT yet. So if you're if you're uh, using the chat thing to try to chat with me, I probably don't see it because I don't I, I, I'm not cultivated in that way yet. Okay. Other questions? All good. Okay. Next things to talk about. Um, the uh, so again. Uh, there are two things. One is PD lore, and one is uh, actual signal processing knowledge, which I'll be developing simultaneously. So the bit of PD lore now is going to be uh, more about messages and um, doing computations using messages, which is to say the sporadic control things that are not audio signals that go down the wires that are only one pixel big instead of two pixels big. Okay. So this is a control message here, and this is a signal message here, or signal, if you like. That's a continuously flowing piece of audio. And what I want to tell you now is that, oh, so first off, one thing that you know from last time is that you can take an oscillator and control it. Whoops, sorry, that's for later. Take an oscillator and control it with a number box like this, and then you've got patch that operates like this. Sorry. Maybe that's, is that loud enough for people to hear? Or should I turn it up? Okay. Alright, so, so now what's, what's happening now is, I'm, uh, instead of having the oscillator be an oscillator space and then a number to initialize the frequency to something, I'm, I'm running a, uh, a number into the oscillator, which is uh, in the form of messages. The oscillator's input actually can take signals or messages either way. <coughs> but it wants numbers. This is, these are messages, and you can tell that, among other things, by the fact that it's a one pixel wide as opposed to a two pixel wide line. And that's just a thing about number boxes. They don't know about audio signals. They just, there's just nothing really that they can do with them. Okay, uh, next thing is, if you want to do something like, say, oh, let me do it this way. If you want to fix it so that you can pre- Determine, whoa, go away. So that you could predetermine some number to put here. You can use another thing which is called a message box. And I'll just put a couple of values in. And now I have a thing which is a push button, but unlike this push button, out comes a message when you, uh, out comes a message which has a number in it when you click it. Now, this is different from, okay, all right, so let me do this while we're here. This is a message. This is a number box. Oops. And this is an object. And the thing that distinguishes them is the borders on them. This is supposed to look like a flag, which is, I mean, using only five pixels of trying to make a representation of that. This is supposed to look like a punched card, and this is just a box to be the simplest possible shape because it's the most frequently used thing. Okay. The, uh, what this is about is the number, okay, now we're, we're not in edit mode. The number does this. You click on it and you drag or you click on it and type to give it values. It's a thing which will generate messages that have numbers in them. This is a thing which lets you type a message in which you just click on and you get the message. This is good because very frequently you want to send something a message that that's what I would say is, very frequently you want to send something a message and you already know what the message is going to be. You don't want to oblige the user of the patch, such as yourself, to have to type the number in because you know what the number is going to be. So now if I want to make a uh, well, I'll, I'll make it. So now if I have a, a, a collection of pitches that I want to hear. Let's, uh, well, I'll leave this for now. Let's do it here. So, things that have frequencies. 
sorry, frequencies that correspond to pitches that we all know uh, well. How about 261.62, that's middle C. And how about a low A? These are just easy to remember ones. And the higher A. Oh, and if you know A, then you can then you know the frequency of E, sort of. I'm, I'm avoiding that, ha having to actually show you how to do the math to do this correctly. That'll that'll happen either Thursday or next Tuesday. Now we say, okay, I don't want to. I want this to be zero, so we're not changing anymore. Let's turn it on. And now I've got. Okay. Now that would. Uh, that would not be a good thing to do with a number box because to make that to make those four notes, I'd have to type those numbers in at, at, at musical speeds. It wouldn't work, right? So uh, almost the only reasonable thing that you can do if you're going to do something like have a musical scale that you want to use is put the numbers somewhere where you can get them. And the simplest way of doing that is to put them in message boxes. Right? Yeah. Sure. Between putting the number after the oscillator, after oscillator until the end, versus yeah. putting a block by the Okay, good. And in fact, um, I was inadvertently a little confusing here because I left the number here. This number is, is sitting there so that this thing, when it was created, was 440, but then I was changing the number by putting these other numbers into it. And those are overriding it, yeah. So this is an initializer. And it's better style, in fact, if you're going to change something, not to initialize it so that, uh, so that it doesn't look like it's 440 when, for instance, it might be 261.62 instead. All right, so that's one thing about that. Another thing is that you can put messages or signals into the oscillator. And one of the, uh, or some of the examples from last Thursday had us putting a signal into the oscillator in order to control the oscillator's frequency. So they are again putting a number into the into the oscillator's first in, inlet, which is its inlet for frequency, sets the frequency, be it by a number like this or by a, an audio signal, which is a stream of numbers. Now the next thing to mention is that there are two inlets up here, and I've never told you what the other inlet is good for. It is a thing for initializing phase. And Initializing phase does not mean that, let's see, okay, so what is phase? Phase is a number which, if you like, uh, varies in time and varies from, say, 0 to 2 pi as a thing cycles. So if I, let's get rid of this multiplier now, it's going to just be confusing. Oh, actually, let me save this. Uh, let me save this and give it a name, which will be... Yuck. This is patch number two, and it's going to be, I don't know what. It's going to have to be the oscillators. Okay, now I can do a save as, and then I can be calling this three. And now we're going to start talking about phase. By the way, I'm, I'm putting these patches up on the website, although I did it a little bit belatedly last time. The patches from Thursday only showed up on Sunday, so if you looked for them before then didn't see them, it's because I haven't gotten it done yet. I actually just forgot. Oh, so if you don't see them after class and want them, send me an email and remind me to put them up because it's the sort of thing I forget to do. Okay, so now, uh, now that I've saved it, I can get rid of this because you got this in the other patch. And in fact, I'm tired of the thing being so quiet, so I'm going to do something. I'm going to make it louder. Okay, and now I'm going to test it so that, yeah, there it goes. Okay, beautiful music. All right, now, um, phase. Okay, so phase is a, oh, right, I want to, I want to graph this. I'm sorry. Ooh, yep, I did this one on this. I'm going to graph it from here. So we're now looking at A440. Uh, so the phase is a number which, um, okay, you can regard this thing as starting at any point during the cycle. Um, a, a mathematically easy place to think of the cycle starting is at the top because then everything is a cosine and cosines are mathematically simpler than, than sines uh, for a reason I'll tell you later if you want to know. 
So you can, but so this is arbitrary. But I'm going to assume that the cycle is starting here, and the cycle then proceeds from the top down to the bottom and then back up to the top. And there, there is a number called phase, which you don't see here, which is going from zero to two pi every time the oscillator is oscillating. Right. So if, if you like the, the old, um, uh, the old metaphor is. Imagine that um, you're in the dark and, and there's a bicycle wheel spinning and there's a light on it and you're looking straight straight down the axis, uh, straight on, along the plane of the thing so you see the light going up and down. The phase is the angle of the bicycle wheel that you don't see. And the thing that you do see is the cosine of the phase, which is the thing which bounces up and down. Later, I'll show you how you can actually generate phases as audio signals and put them into things in order to control this process in greater um, in greater detail, but right now I'm not going to do that because it's more detail than we can deal with right now. I'm just going to mention that phase is a thing which you can initialize, but then the oscillator itself maintains a phase which changes in time. And now what I want to do is maybe let's uh, yeah right. I probably should have kept the other oscillator. Okay, so we'll do this. Duplicate. Oh, yeah. Um, if you haven't found out yet, uh, the fastest way to make an object is to select one, but without selecting its text, and then to hit duplicate, which will in fact copy any amount of patch that you want. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to now go back, sorry, and make an oscillator with a number controlling its um, frequency, and then I'm going to play it. So multiply them to control the amplitude, and then we'll hear the output. I'll show you why in a second, I hope. Okay, so I'm going to say 1 hertz, 440, play. Alright. Yeah. Uh, command D. Or it's up in edit. There. Oh, control D for me, but command D. All right. Uh, okay. Now, next thing is uh, this oscillator, of course, also has a phase which is going from zero to two pi once a second. You can change the phase, but the phase is also always changing. Oh, so let's make this number. Let's make it slower so that you can hear what's going on. I'll make it every four seconds. Okay. And now I'm going to go into the other inlet. make something that just bashes the phase to zero. I can graph this for you, but I will have to just graph. Oh, yeah, I'll have to just graph this, I think. And furthermore, because it's moving slowly, oh, but I'll still use it here. Uh, because it's moving slowly, I'll make the table be huge so that you can see things that are happening slowly. So, yeah, in fact, let's put this back at one. And then I'm going to make this thing happen at properties. I'm going to make it have a whole second's worth of stuff in it. So 44,100, that's a second's worth of sound. Oh uh, yeah, let's change the name. Uh, okay. Actually, I'm just going to uh, do that. All right. New name, new array. Ooh, yes, right. And Furthermore, I forgot I have to make the. Oh, it's good. Never mind. All right, and let's record it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Let's make it talk to the right array. Okay, now if I tell it to record, I have to wait a second before I see it. It doesn't show the thing to you until it's finished recording it into the array, which is which is why you make the arrays kind of short if you want to. So now what we're seeing is every time I whack it, I'm going to see one second of the sign of, of G1 
just this amplitude controlling sinusoid. sinusoid going and you say, now make the phase be zero, please. It makes the phase zero all right, which means that there's a discontinuity in the sound, which in uh, computer music lore means that you will hear a click. So discontinuities or step functions are clicks, or one source of clicks. Yeah? Sure enough. Yeah, so I could do this. Uh, I'll do even a little bit better in a second, but let's do that for now. So now we'll listen to it again. And now I'll say, set the phase, please. And it set the phase and started uh, graphing at exactly the same time. So now, anytime I hit it, I'll hear something. Well, I'll hear a discontinuity in the sound. Actually, you're hearing two. One is, one is when I make the discontinuity by doing this. something even better. Introducing the uh, introducing the delay object. So this is going to be an object. It's called delay. And I'm going to say delay 400. 400 milliseconds of delay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my nice button set the uh, start graphing then 400 milliseconds later, it's going to set the phase of the oscillator to zero. Alright, now no matter what I do, okay, I hear, I hear this continuity four tenths of a second after I whack the button. I notice this part of the table is changing, but at a fixed 400 milliseconds into the table, sets the phase to zero, and thereafter, whoa, every once in a while something like that will happen, and thereafter the thing is always the same, that's to say any time I whack the button I will have a nice consistent result starting at the starting point. You cannot put your guitar into this delay. There's another one for that, which I'll show you later. This is a delay for messages. What that means is that, well, I'll show you. Um, yes, thank you. Yes. So delay, what it does is, when you send it a trigger, it sends you the, it sends you the trigger, the amount of delay later. So if you've been following me, uh, what I'll do now is I'll say this delay, let's make it a longer delay, like two seconds. Okay, now zero, one, two. Whoops, I didn't count right. All right. Okay, and now if I graph that, didn't hit until after the after the thing had finished writing into the array. The array is one second long. The phase is getting set after two seconds. It's hopeless. I'm not going to see anything. You can hear it, though. Okay, good. So, are people following this? This is important because this is how you would set about making sequences, you know, things that, that have an order in time. Um, for instance, it's just going to get crowded. Okay, let me save this. I'm going to do a save as again. So now we'll make a dumb sequencer. Okay. We'll make a smart sequencer later. Uh, the dumb sequencer is going to look like this. I'm going to get rid of this. Uh, don't need that. 
So I have this nice um, A minor chord here. So I'm going to make the thing arpeggiate. Right? It's going to be easy, right? All I'm going to do is I have a nice button. Let's see, I don't have this anymore. I'm going to have the button bash us to low A. And then, I don't know, 150 milliseconds later. How do I know what number to use? I've done a lot of this. And then another 150 milliseconds later. And then another 150 milliseconds later. And then let's just go back down. Why not? OK, this is, uh, let's see, we can connect the output of that, we can put that, and just go, mm -hmm. right. let's see if that's going to work. All right, so now we'll play it. All right, now we got Beethoven. <laughs> Not really, OK. OK, and of course the punchline. Let's just take this one and connect it over here. Now we got. Whoops, I did something wrong. Oh, yeah, I know what I did wrong. I need another delay before I loop it, don't I? So, another 150 milliseconds later, I'll go back around. Okay. okay. <laughs> Do this at home and not here, right? <laughs> In fact, I, I will try not to play that anymore now. <laughs> okay, what's... Um, oh, there are little things that, that maybe you could want, like, to be able to stop this. There's only one way I could stop this right now with what you know, which is to break one of the connections and wait for it to run out. Uh, there are ways, but... Um, get there when we get there. Um, but now what's happening is the following thing. There are two, you know, there are two parts of the patch. There's a part of the patch that's doing control, and there's a part of the patch that's doing signal processing. The part that's doing control, and, and by the way, that's jargon. Control and signal processing aren't really two different things that you could do. They're all part of one thing. But in PD land, you think of those two things as being two different things simply because they're two different computer science-ish constructs that, that, make, that, that, that represent them. Right? Okay, so let's see, let me this. Okay, so what's happening is the control stuff is all this. The signal stuff is all this, and maybe this, I don't know how to characterize the array. And the control computations are happening at specific instants in time. In fact, it's happening about seven times a second because this is about a seventh of a second. And what is happening here is that, oh, let me show you what's happening. Get another one of these buttons. Oh, let's be even clearer. I'll put that button here. And, uh, yeah, goodness. Let's see. Let's not do that. Let's do uh, this. Oh, that was a mistake. Oh, it's okay. I can do this. Do button. I need a start button. But then I could always just sort of have buttons that show me what's happening. Yeah, this is going to be kind of painful. Let's not do the whole thing, but I'll just do these two. All right. Okay. So now there are messages flying around in a very particular choreographed way. So each one of those delays is, is the source of a message, if you like. And what that message does, so, so the message whose formal name is bang. Oh, I can print it out for you. Let's make an object which is called print. And we'll see what this message looks like. And there's the mini printout window there. Um, all right, so bang is just a word that, that means I don't have any numbers for you, but do it anyway. Right? In other words, well, you wouldn't just say a space or something like that to say a trigger. You have to have something to, to print there. So bang is just a verb that says whatever it is that you normally do, it's time to do it right now. It's a trigger, if you like. Okay, and this message bang is coming out of the delay and it's doing three things. 
uh, it's hard to see because of the messy crossing lines. But one thing is it's it's causing this message, uh, sorry, this this uh, bang object to flash. This push button rather. Okay. Another thing that it's doing is it's sending a bang to this message box 261.62 and what is that doing in exchange? It is putting out oh my oh yes right okay so there are two messages coming into here from this delay and from another delay further over and anytime either one of those things goes off it's getting printed here and we're getting that number out yeah It'll complain. It won't even connect it because uh, because print expects control messages. However, I could put a print tilde after that, and then I would be looking at the audio sit for you know 64 samples worth of the audio sit. Am I going too slow? No. All right. This is good. Okay. Good. So to go back. So the, if you like, the outlet of this delay, this whatever, whatever you hook up here, uh, talks to a tree, that's to say, a, a graph without any loops of, of stuff. And the stuff is what happens when that thing goes off. And, and the tree stops whenever you either can uh, change from being a control message to a signal, or it stops whenever you put it into something that doesn't do anything as a result. I'll show you lots of ways that things are not doing anything as a result of that later. That, that's going to happen. So if you like the tree of, of things that depend from this bang outlet consists of this delay, which by the way doesn't do anything instantly, so that so the tree doesn't go further through that. So so what this tree is is everything that happens right when that bang happens, and not stuff that happens later as an indirect result of it. So this delay, when it receives a bang, its job when it receives a bang is to schedule itself for 150 milliseconds into the future. So it doesn't. So it does that scheduling job, which is a side effect in computer science language, right? And meanwhile, it returns, which is to say, uh, that's the end of that uh, arm of the graph or that subgraph, the subtree, I should call it. So. And there are three things. So first off, there's the bang, and then there's the delay, and then there is this message box, which puts out a number, and that number goes down to the oscillator. And that is the entire, uh, what's the right word? That, that's the entire uh, chain of events that takes place when this delay goes off. So I should, I could, um, let's see, shift. Just to select everything that is in the, tree hanging from that delay object. Uh, make that be a tree and not have um, loops in it. Because if you put a loop in there, then PD will try it in, in a zero amount of time to do an infinite amount of stuff, which is to traverse the loop as if it were a tree. And PD will then think hard, and then after a while, depending on the speed of your machine, it'll, it'll complain to, and say, stack overflow for a technical reason. So, for instance, if, if you want me to, if you want to see me do that, let's see, uh, I'll get a nice number and hook it up to another number and do it back like that. This is illegal. So, PD can't really sense this, so it, it, didn't, it didn't stop me from editing it because the editor doesn't know that something bad is going to happen. But something bad is going to happen when I put a number in here. Oh, yeah, I get stack overflows. It's actually pretty good at detecting at that time. Sometimes it's better than other times, depending on the OS and the particular thing you're doing. So your mileage will vary. You can bring PD to its knees this way. Why? Uh, why was this not a good thing to do? The first message box, uh, sorry, the first number box, the one on the left, if you like, tells the other one uh, B96, and by the way, output 96, and then return. After that, you're done. Right. Depth, uh, for your computer scientists, this is depth, depth first tree river, uh, traversal. Thank you. Yeah. So, the, so the message box on the right then says, "Oh, I just got a message 96. What I'm going to do now is tell the sorry, I'm going to tell the number box on the left, change yourself to 96. It already was, but no matter, change it, you know, repeat it anyway. 
And then that one says, okay, before I'm done, I want you to change to 96. And it says, okay, that's good. Before I'm done, I want you to change to 96, and so on forever. It's an infinite loop. It's actually a recursive loop. Uh, but it's theoretically infinite. And PD couldn't deal with it because eventually it ran out of memory. With its, uh, recursion involves pushing stack frames. Okay. Uh, you can also not make uh, loops out of signals. Right? Signals hate loops too, but they hate them in a different way. So when I do this, uh, let's see. Let's take a let's let's take a nice signal and multiply it by five. Okay. There's there are a lot of reasons you should not try to do something like this. And after that's done, I'll multiply it by five. And after that's done, I'll multiply it by five again, and so on. And now, why didn't I get an error? Oh, because I turned it off. It says DSP loop detected, some tilde, uh, and then some, something I can't read, but you can do it and find out. This is, this is not the same kind of loop as that, because notice we've got fat connections here and thin connections there. The, the error is found at different times. Here, uh, PD was smart enough to figure out that there was an error because it's much more able to analyze what will happen as a result of signal analysis than, or signal flow than messages. Why? Because if messages uh, contain decision-making objects and to analyze a message uh, computation, you would have to analyze a Turing machine, which is formally impossible. Signals uh, are analyzed as a graph. You simply know that a signal crunches a number every sample, and so there's no, there, so there's no, um, so there's no decision making to be done or to be second guessed, and so you can predict in advance how it's going to happen. This is important because it allows PD to operate on the signals very, very efficiently. What it really does is it pre it doesn't exactly pre-compile it, but, but it essentially uh, figures out in advance what it's going to have to do for the signal network and then sets it up to do it very op very optimizedly, optimally. Right. Okay, so it analyzes this. It, know, it knows what, how this thing is going to act, and so it knows how to do it, how to linearize it, how to make it happen in, in an order. And gee whiz, it discovers that there's no possible way to do it because you have to have done to have finished each one of them before you can start the other. And so neither of them can ever be run. So that's an error. That can't, that can't be done. Uh, what will happen to you when you make that error is those two things just won't run, and the rest of your patch will run. And but if you see that, it means that you're doing something wrong. You should probably find out what it is. By the way, uh, you can always say find last error. And if PD was able to figure out what object created the last error, it will uh, it, it will um, go to that window and and um, turn that object blue for you. Select that object for you. That's a useful tool. Okay, so that this is a so this is a this is not a uh, that's a loop, and this is a loop, and they are and they both fail. Now this is not a loop in that sense, even though it is, even though it looks like one. Uh, I didn't make it really look like one very well, but maybe I could do this. Well, I don't know how to make this patch pretty so you can see it. So, but what's happening now is each, each delay's output is going to the next one's input and so on at infinitum until the last one's going back into the first one. That's not a loop because the delay, when it receives a message, does not, as a result, put a message out. Instead, it schedules a message for the future. So in, in a sense, it's the, end of the, it's the end of the line. It doesn't have any direct effect to put a bang into the delay. Questions about this? I promised you I wasn't going to play it anymore, but here's how you would make the thing uh, have a controllable tempo. You would just hook numbers into these inlets of the delay. Yeah, I'm not going to do it because I've already had enough of that. <laughs> if you want to hear more of that, you have to make it yourself, but then use headphones. <laughs> All right, questions about this? That was a lot of information, some of which was a little bit abstract. And I'll, I'll try to find ways of, of stubbing our toes on this again later. Yeah? Yeah. Ooh, thank you. Yes, okay. So I should have told you that right when I was telling you about setting phases of oscillators. 
The only thing I ever set the phase to was zero. Uh, let's see, let me save this. And did I? Um, yeah, okay, I can go back to this example. Okay, so I'm going to go back a little bit. And oh, what did I just do? Go away. I want to save the change in cancel, whatever that was. Yeah. So let's say I'm getting nervous now because I just made a window, I didn't know that. Okay, this is a no, thank you. Oh, let's save it. Zero objects. Right, good. Okay, so the dumb sequencer we're now going to close and tell it goodbye for a while. Now I'm going to go back here and start setting phases of the oscillator. We'll go back to only waiting four tenths of a second so that. Ooh, interesting. All right. set the phase of this oscillator to three quarters, which means another quarter of a cycle in, we will be at one. And uh, let's see, equivalently, I could have set the phase to minus one quarter, like this. This is exactly the same thing. Boom. Set one of the phases to zero and the other phase to, that's the cosine, and the minus a quarter or plus three quarters for the cosine, and then you'll have two things that are out of phase. And that's uh, 90 degrees out of phase if you like, or pi over two radians, or one quarter cycle, which is the way the we think about it. Yeah. Can you do exactly what you said? Oh. Alright. Yeah. How would you get two of them to be out of phase? Why don't you do this? Why don't you set one of them to, okay, you're going to have to have two oscillators, and one of them, so you can set their phases to whatever you want to. Okay. So what's out of phase? If you want one of them to be at peaking while the other one goes through zero, then give them two numbers that differ by a quarter, quarter cycle. Or if you want them to, one of them to peak up while the other peaks down, then set them a half cycle apart. And this you will want to do using message boxes. Message boxes are the right tool for doing this because that's where you can put a number in that will happen without someone having to type the number in while they're using the patch. Yeah. You know, um, we're not going to have a good grading policy the first time around because we're just going to be citing the thing in. So basically, for the first homework, if the thing works, it's full credit, regardless of whether you were elegant or inelegant. And then we will discuss after that, or I'll, you know, the TA and I will talk, Joe and I will talk, and we'll try to figure out what to do after that. And we will either decide to uh, make simple, elegant patches be worth more than ugly, horrible patches, 
Or we'll decide that ugly horrible patches are worth more than elegant patches, depending on, <laughs> depending on what seems to be uh, pedagogically the most appropriate choice. <laughs> but for right now, I just get it to work and it's good. Yeah? Yeah. Like how do you? Oh. Sounds distorted. Oh, so you're probably not doing it right yet. <laughs> so okay, so good. So there are two things there. One is, uh, uh, one is, what's the difference between those two sounds? And can you hear it? Um, but you've already got that, which is, it sounds distorted and it's also sounding at the wrong pitch. Uh, why is it sounding distorted? It's for reasons that I explained Thursday, you're overloading something. I don't know what, because I don't see the patch, but either you are putting two sinusoids at full blast into the DAC, it's, it's, its range is from minus one to one. And if you are adding two full blast sinusoids into it, you're going outside of the range of minus one to one, and it will be clipping. Then you'll hit, if you put a clip on, then it'll just clip, and you'll still hear the distortion. You have to actually get the amplitudes down to where the thing can play it without distorting. The other thing is, even if your patch is formally correct, depending on your audio hardware, it might distort. But your TA knows this, and so his audio will not be distorted. <laughs> so if, if it sounds distorted on your computer, it's just conceivable it'll sound clean on his, but if it sounds distorted, uh, on his computer, it already sounded distorted on his computer. There's a syllogism there somewhere, but I can't spit it out right now. All right, other questions? Yeah. How would you offset a Oh, oh right. So how do you find out what okay, I think what you're asking is how do you find out what the phase of an oscillator is while it's running? So that you could change it to something else and it could depend on you need another object that I haven't two other objects that I haven't told you about to be able to do that. Uh, they are phaser tilde because you have to actually deal with the phase of the number, and snapshot tilde, which is the look at a signal to see where it's at object. And those will come up probably next week. Uh, Maybe phaser shows up tomorrow, but uh, sorry, on Thursday, but snapshot not until next week. So you can set things right now, but you can't like uh, query your patch as to how the signal processing is doing programmatically yet. Yeah. Uh, WebCT believes that it's due at 3:30. So that means that if it doesn't show up at 3:30, WebCT will flag it late. Um, WebCT won't even take it if it's more than a week late. And we haven't yet set the schedule of when we will grade it, but we should get it done before grading starts because it's much, much easier for the TA to grade it all in one batch than it's to do it My guess is that, my guess is that uh, Joe won't be able to download it until five because he's going to be sitting in class. But on the other hand, if he gets bored, he might actually decide to start downloading while, <laughs> while I'm talking. I don't think he will. <laughs> so yeah, it seems like he probably got until five anyhow. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> but come to office hours after class and I can, and I can help you and maybe you can be done before you go to class. Yeah, other questions? Oh right, we haven't decided how late late is, or, or and we don't have a late policy yet. Yeah, all this we have to figure out how the class works before we can set things. Yeah. Other questions? All right, I want to um, quickly show you another object, just because. Um, well, you'll see why. All right, so. So this is the delay object. There is also another one which is called metro, which is the metronome. And this is an object which takes, a, takes two numbers in. So you get a number box. So 
can't remember the key accelerator. Oh, you know what? Let's do save as, because this is going to this is going to be confusing now. So now we're going to say five metronome. And I don't know whether to leave all this stuff, so right now I'll just leave it. Okay. And this is an object which. When you turn it on, it does this. And when you turn it off, it does that. All right, that's useful. And furthermore, um, you can control, uh, sorry, yeah, I'll leave this 400 in here for now, but you can control the number of times per second it happens. So 1,000 means it's every millisecond. and. That's what, um, and then if I want to double the tempo, I should have this number and make it 500, which means every 500 milliseconds, which is twice a second. Yeah. This is the initial. This initializes the amount that that you are. Oh right, I have. To, I should probably sort of say something about initialization. So anytime you give an object an argument like delay 400 or metro 400 or plus 400 uh, or even OSC tilde 400, the argument, the 400 or whatever number it is, is an initializer for the for the parameter that the object uses. If there is one parameter, if there is more than one parameter, you might want to give it more than one number, but you haven't seen that happen yet. I've been going, I've been trying to do things in an order that allows me to uh, start to start things gently. So, so what this is saying is when this object is created, uh, it's going to be 400, but when I s send this number in, it will change it to 500. Now, let me confuse you a little bit in order to try to unconfuse you. Uh, the, it's not universally true that the number that you initialize this to is changed by this inlet. In the case of Metro, this is a thing which turns it on and off. And any number that's not zero means on, and any number that is zero means off. Right? This is the uh, this is the new value of 400 up here, which is now 500. Right? So right now it's not a metro 400. Morally speaking, it's a metro 500. Okay, yeah. So this this thing here, this is a control which uh, control. What's the right word? It's a um, Control in the, in the GUI sense of the word. It's a thing which shows its state and, and allows you to mouse its state to change it. These things, messages and objects, are things that you type a text into and that defines what they are forever. Right? So the number, you, you, you actually don't type this number in when you create it. Uh, in fact, in edit mode, you can't even edit that number. It's, it's a thing which you change. It's a thing whose job is to change numbers at, at runtime. These other things you type, you you put these these things in at edit time, and they are they are where they are what they are while the patch is running. And so this is uh, right. So so this is when you're playing the patch and making the, the sound change and you know trying to make people dance. You're, you you have the patch locked at that point. You're not developing your patch anymore, and so you're using the number box and the button and other things like that to. Um, to be running the patch, basically, to be changing the state of the patch. But the functionality of the patch, the, the computer program that the patch is, is determined by the topology, that's to say how things are connected together, and it's also determined by what particular things you type into message and object boxes. Okay, okay now, uh, to slightly further confuse the situation, uh, another example of a thing being initialized uh, came up earlier. It's uh, that you can initialize an oscillator to a frequency like that. But now to change that frequency, you would put messages into uh, you put messages into the frequency inlet, which is the first inlet. The oscillator as a tilde object, it's a signal processing object doesn't take messages to start and stop, or to do its thing the way the metronome does. It, it, it takes, all it does is take messages to modify what it does, which is so its frequency. It's, it's always running, it doesn't need to be turned on. 
That's because it's a tilde object. So in general, in tilde objects, the, um, the first inlet, the leftmost inlet, is uh, usually the thing that you can control by, uh, sorry, here, usually the thing that you can control by changing the argument. Whereas in objects like Metro, this number is being controlled by this inlet because this inlet is used to turn the ring on and off. That's, there, there's no very good generalization. These objects are all designed to be as coherent as they can be, but there's a limit to how coherent they are, but they can be because they're, they all have radically different functions depending on the types of things they are. So that's something you just have to remember. Yeah? Did you put the band out of the metro just for a visual? Or? Yes, I did that just to show you what was happening. Yeah, so this would be doing the same thing if I had this connected to it or not. Objects don't know what they're connected to. Right? They just they put their output out there, and if there's nobody connected to them, the output doesn't get used. And if there are 50 things connected to them, the output goes everywhere. All right. Well, yeah. Yeah, so a couple. Of, so let's... Um, hmm. All right, I can make, yeah, I can think of nice and ugly ways of making that happen. Like, for instance, what if I, um, yeah, what if I actually use this patch? Let's turn it on and listen to it. Okay, so there's this oscillator, it's at 3 hertz. Now I'm going to just set the thing to something every 400, every 400 milliseconds. Sorry, 500 milliseconds. doing is I'm changing the phase of the oscillator, or setting the phase of the oscillator, which is causing a discontinuity in the sound. Whoa. Right, uh, that, that came up before, but I said it kind of fast. If you hit the shift key while you're scrolling it, uh -huh. you're scrolling in hundreds. And if you don't, then you're scrolling in minutes. Any questions? All right, so now what would happen if you took this metronome and 400, well, whatever it is, every 100 milliseconds now, I'm just going to set the oscillator to 3, to three hertz. Well, the oscillator was already at 3 hertz, so it doesn't do anything to set the oscillator to 3 hertz. It stays at 3 hertz, so that has no effect. On the other hand, uh, don't try this at home. You can have two of them and make them fight. Let's make this one go at some nice other speed, like 161.8. We all know that number, right? And now we'll put that up to no E, no A, no E, right? All right, that's um, compositional algorithms 101. Um, about why that did what it did. <laughs> if you want. Okay, so, oh, but, but I should tell you what it did, which is this. These two things are putting out bangs. They're putting them out at different rates. One of them is happening every 10 times a second, one of them is happening 10 times 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2 times per second. Golden ratio. I, should, I just chose that because it always sounds good when you make things have a golden ratio. Okay, now, uh, 10 times a second, we're bashing the frequency to 220, and some other number of times a second, we're bashing it to 330. In fact, if we want to see what that's doing, we could just say, why don't you show me the frequency of this oscillator? And then we have the schizoid frequency here. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Two and three. All right, yeah, there's ASCII art to be gotten here, isn't there? <laughs> right. 
Okay. So this is now this is now using uh, yeah. This is now having two different inputs to the oscillator, which are telling it to do different things, and they don't get added or anything like that. They would get added if they were signals, but since they are messages which happen at different times, it doesn't make sense to add them. And so instead, it just becomes a situation where whoever sets it last wins. So if someone's opening a door and someone else is closing a door, is the door open or closed? Well, it depends on who got there most recently. So the, so the last person to the last person to set it wins. And meanwhile, what you hear is the thing changing between the two values in whatever tempo it makes that, that the two things are happening at different times. Is that clear? Okay, so this is, all right, so now this is a, uh, this shows in, in some way kind of the, the essential difference between the, the, the sporadic control message computations and signal computations. If, if you want to do something that happens at if you want to do something that has to do with decision making or has to do with events that happen in time, like waiting for network packets or waiting a certain amount of time or waiting until a keyboard key goes down or something like that, you are in message land. And message rules are that when something comes out of something, like this metronome generates events and the event uh, traverses the tree of everything that is connected to it until it gets to something that doesn't respond but simply changes its state or does something by side effect, at which point we have done that, that tree of, of, of messages that depends from this metronome itself. Is that clear? And a good part of computer music is thinking of cool networks for controlling these, um, these signal processing networks. Uh, one thing about that is it takes it takes brains of an entirely different sort to know how to make good control structures from having from knowing how to make good signal processing structures. Signal processing structures are uh, it's very mathematical. You need to be able to deal with trig and stuff like that. You need to be able to think about spectra of sounds. Uh, for doing control, there uh, actually knowledge doesn't seem to help you very much. Uh, no one really has a good way of, of um, theorizing about how people should control computers and, and computer music applications. And as a result, you just sort of learn a, a collection of techniques which might involve how to respond to external events, how to make decisions, how to, how to generate random numbers, uh, how to, to solve problems involving constraints, um, and so on like that. I, I, I don't even know how to make the list. But, but what that looks like is like the field of combinatorics, which is a whole bunch of just different things that are different ideas that you have to know a lot of in order to be effective at it. And you just have to wait till you've seen a whole bunch of things or invented a whole bunch of things, and then you have a nice repertory of, of stuff that you can put together into meaningful <coughs> patches. So both of those things are things that take a tremendous amount of, of work to acquire well. The signal processing, you can do in a more systematic kind of a way, I think, than, than the control aspect of it. And furthermore, it's a little bit artificial to separate them at all. <coughs> All right, so review of what happened today. <laughs> a lot happened today. Uh, okay, so the new stuff that you saw uh, was these messages. And then I got to show you how you could, you know, like make things like sets of numbers that, that you could then call up at different times. Um, there were, uh, I think, um, there should have been three new objects, but I can't remember what they were. Um, there were delay and metronome. And, um, Maybe that's all I've shown you. Oh, I forgot to show you one. And I don't have time now. I'll tell you what it is. Um, I also meant to show you this wonderful object here. Line tilde. Which is your, um, which is your all purpose ramp generator. So I will, um, I'll start showing you that in detail next time. Actually, since we have five minutes, I'll show you what it does and what your appetite, and then you can get help on it, and then I'll show you in detail how to use it next time. This is the better amplitude control object. So we've been using oscillators to control amplitude, I'll come clean now, just because I didn't want to introduce another object right away. But it's not 
really the thing that you do all the time to use an oscillator to control the amplitude of another oscillator. More often, what you want to do is this. Let's see, let's get, let's turn these things off because otherwise it's going to be nuts. Okay, so now we have a nice frequency. Now what I'm going to do is say, don't need this, don't need that. Don't need this, need line. And line is going to now have a message going into it. And the message is going to have two numbers, I haven't told you about this yet, a, a value and a time to attain the value at. So here's on and here's off in a second. Now I have the following wonderful thing. I'll turn DSP on. There's my 220 hertz. And there's my 220 hertz shutting up. All right. There are several new concepts here. One thing is message boxes can have more than one number. And so messages don't necessarily consist only of numbers. They're, uh, they're actually quite free form, although a lot of the time messages are just numbers. Uh, line tilde will, will interpret a message with two numbers to mean this is the value we're going to attain and this is the amount of time we're going to attain it in. So that this is a faster one. As opposed to this. So this is the way you make sounds that turn on and off when you want them to, as opposed to just when the oscillator's phase changes appropriately. Yeah? Uh, oh, it's 1,000 milliseconds, and that's the amount of time that it took to rise. And what I intended to do, and got lost in details instead, was graph this for you in the same way as I was doing before. See, we're going to do delay, blah, and button. Sorry, this is going to be over in just a second. And we're going to graph the line to the. Ta da! There's what a line does. It sits there doing nothing until you tell it to do something, and 400 milliseconds later, I told it to go, sorry, I told it to go up to 1 in 100 milliseconds. Yuck. Oh, okay. Okay, so now what's happening is the line is sitting at zero. A little bit, turn it off. Oh, that's nice. Turn it off. So I asked it now to go up to 1 in 100 milliseconds, and what it did was uh, it starts graphing. 400 milliseconds later, it says, line, turn on. And it turns on, and it takes a tenth of a second to reach its target value of 1. And furthermore, I can now tell it to turn off. And then it waits 400 milliseconds and then does that. This is your way of getting stuff to start and stop, which is kind of one of those crucial things that musicians need to be able to do with their sounds. Questions? Okay, and more about this next time, maybe. Uh, it's time to stop for now. <laughs>